The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Jennifer is going to give a message this morning to explain, I believe, a lot of what's been happening over the last month. We've been really entering into some good spiritual experience, and she feels the need to give the theology behind it, but I've got a surprise for her. See, we pray together in the same room. I watch the transition that's taken place in this woman, and things and I want her to share before she begins, because this is the part she'll skip. She'll get into the theology, and she may not tell you her approach. I want you to tell, tell them that what we've entered into in the last month, I want tell, just tell them your, your, your private journey. 30 years? Okay. That's my, okay, it's working. 30 years ago, I read a book that a lot of you may have read and it was Reese Howell's Intercessor by Norman Grubb. In chapter five, it tells how the Holy Spirit came and took complete possession of him. This was 30 years ago. Well, I wanted to know what that was that happened to him and how could I enter into that. And I realized at the time that it was a complete surrender. We were singing the words this morning, but it was a complete surrender to God. And God took over full control of his life, just like the Holy Spirit lived in Jesus during his earth walk. And he was, it was called Reese Howell's intercessor. And intercessor can mean like a priestly function bridging the gap between heaven and earth. But in this case, he actually was um, a man of prayer. And the Lord brought him together later with like-minded um, people who prayed and turned the course of World War II. He was also a revival starter because one of the marks of coming to this level is that you become a fire starter. And so wherever he went to speak, revival broke out after that point in time. And so over the years, the Lord taught me the theology behind it. But I didn't know how to have that. And last summer, um, we were in our prayer time, and God opened up, particularly the 14th chapter of John, where Jesus laid out for his disciples what he had been wanting to tell them. And he said, the secret is it's the Father in me who does the works. And I and my Father are one, and you and I will be one, and my Father and I will come make our home within you. This is the place of the greater works. It's not the giftings. It's the Father himself doing the greater works through completely surrendered lives. And so God opened up John 14 to me, and I was grieving over the state of the church and the world, and I can clearly see, and I know you can clearly see, that there's so much going on in the world that God needs an army of Reese Howells to bring light into the darkest of dark days that we're in now. And so I said, Lord, I know what I'm asking. Full surrender, fully possessed by God. But I said, but God, is there not a cause? How many years do I have left on this earth? I'm in my 60s. Dennis is pushing 70. Lord, if I don't give the rest of my life for that, because that's why he bought us, to give our lives for that, so he could have a God-possessed people on the earth. I said, I would stand before you, Jesus, and I would say, Lord, I wasted my life. And so I kept saying, Lord, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? And Dennis, not knowing what I've been praying for weeks and months daily to the Lord, Dennis said to me, you have what you want. And so fortunately, 
God sent us a group of people, and he said, out of these people, you're not a church. I want you to create an upper room to birth a church. That is how the early church was birthed, with people who came to that level of commitment I'm still not getting power. personal okay. enough. Okay. I want you to so. ask for the experience, because right. this is quality. This is a quality woman, but the quality oh. is in the heart attitude, right. not in right. fancy talk. And so oh, you asked said, the Lord about this experience. And he said, would it be okay to you, with you if it was a quiet feeling and you didn't have a major experience in God? And I said, sure. And then he said to me, would you still believe this theology you studied for 30 years if you never experienced yourself? And I said, yes, Lord, I'd still believe. Might not be real happy, but I would still... <laughs> But I would still believe because I know this is what fills the Bible from Genesis when the presence of God among his people was lost until today. That's it. That's the part I knew she wouldn't put in the message. But I think you need to hear that because there's a cost. People would like you to lay hands and get something for nothing without any effort on their part. And then complain they didn't get it. <laughs> this, this is a pursuit of a deeper work of the cross, a greater surrender to his lordship. And interestingly enough, as much as I've known she's pursued this, you know, you can have correct theology for, for decades, but the experience of that theology makes all the difference in the world. And okay, so, how much so was a, a month, month ago, ago, a month ago, Jason gets it first. Or, the, or the first part of the it. The first part of it. And He's walking around and I'm crying, going, coming over. He just sits, comes day. over and sits on the sofa and weeps and prays for us and nothing happens. So <laughs> after a while, I was sitting there and all of a sudden, sovereignly, I got an experience in God. We call it the second level. Um, but you know what? Uh, I can remember studying the, his, the history of the greats. Most of them didn't care what you call it as long as they, <laughs> as long as they had it. They let them argue over the terminology and stuff. Like, Don't go there. I need Jesus. That's what it is. And then I prayed for Jennifer. Two days later. Two days later for impartation, and it took. Well, let me explain Everything. this. Uh, 30 years ago also. Okay, that's all I, I wanted to say. I so now a, it's Jennifer. I was in a church service. And I saw in a flash Jesus standing in front of me. My hands were up like this. Interesting, that's the surrender posture. And he placed his hands on mine, and he turned and stepped inside me. This is what we're calling the replaced life because probably most of the people in our church have already entered into this. And I want to tell you, it's a reality, and it's a way to live, and it's a different perception entirely. Those of you who haven't received it yet will pray for you after the service. Those of you who've never even heard of this, if you want that, what we're calling the second level, um, we'll pray for you too. And I think probably all we ought to be praying for some physical healings because we know some people are hurting in their physical bodies. But I want to give you the theology. And actually, I've never heard more heresy in the past 10 years than I have the entire rest of my life. I mean, there I thought they couldn't even invent more heresies. And yet, even new ones are being invented, even since the 90s. It's, it's appalling. So I see a great need to tell you what we can have and what the Bible says about it. And what I'm going to be teaching you today, I now see clearly all the way from the heart of God, all the way from Genesis to Revelation. And so let me get to my notes. And this message is called The Secret of Union. Three levels of restoration. Did you pay any attention to the words we were singing this morning? Besides, I surrender. We were asking for the fire within. We were asking for the fire of God within. And 
God, we were saying, God, you won't relent until you have it all, have all my heart, all of me. And that's really the commitment that God wants a company of people to make. Now, we're talking about the three levels, and I find it very interesting that there have been two great awakenings in America. You know, America has a covenant with God. One of the covenants was made with French Huguenots, early settlers in Fort Caroline, Florida, when they were martyred as they were crying out the the Psalm of David, I will give no rest or no slumber to my eyes until you come and make a dwelling place for yourself here. And they dedicated America to be a dwelling place of God. It hasn't happened yet. 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 And there was, of course, the covenant that the pilgrims made on Plymouth for this country to be one nation under God, a shining city on a hill, a light for all the world to see. Have you ever heard a scripture that talks about the restoration of all things, that Jesus is held in heaven until the time of the restoration of all things? I once thought that when man messed up something, whether it was a purpose of a nation or a move of God, that, oh, well, God will just start fresh. Well, God opened my eyes to show me that this beginning now in our day, in our generation, God is going to take all those things that men messed up and he's going to ignite them again and bring them to their full and complete purpose in God. I believe America has a unique call on it, and God is getting ready to tear down the Tower of Babel that's been erected all over the earth, and he's going to bring our nation and many nations back to the original purposes of God for those nations. Because God's not going to do away with nations, and they're going to be sheep nations and goat nations at the second coming of Jesus. But... I could share more about the covenants and all that with you and the things that that God taught me, but know this, that there are good days ahead for America. The first great awakening was the salvation experience. It's so interesting that these three correspond to the three levels that God wants to do in our lives to bring us back into oneness with God. The first great awakening, salvation became a common experience across the 13 colonies and it just wiped away church denomination walls it wiped away state walls between people and it literally forged one nation under god through a common salvation experience and that was the revelation of the son jesus now the second great awakening also called the holiness movement was in more than just America. It swept through England and Wales and all over the earth. And people came into an experience that, for our purposes here, I'm calling the replaced life, where Jesus actually replaces our life and lives out of us. Now, that's for our personal victory. And we have um, pamphlets and a booklet on the back table Uh, about the replaced life and then resisting temptation and sin after the replaced life for daily living. And that will explain all that to you. I'm going to give you a brief summary of that. But what we're moving into now, this coming awakening that I believe has already started, but I know it started with Jason and with us here in the replaced life, this is going to end up the knowledge of the Father, the one who does the greater works, coming to dwell in a company. It was the Son of God, the Holy Spirit, and by Holy Spirit, a lot of people have some spirit, but they don't have much holy. (laughs) This is the Holy Spirit. And the Father, the awakening of the Father, the Father's awakening. You may have heard many, many international prophets have prophesied about the Father's awakening, and this is going to prepare the bride for Jesus. Okay, well, that's what's current here. When Paul was speaking to the church in the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 6.16, he pulled a scripture out of the Old Testament, and he said, why are you doing these things? Why are you doing all this? The sexual immorality of the Corinthians, oh, at least the Jews knew not to do that stuff. And, boy, they must have been like a bunch of bad kids 
Paul wasn't used to people who didn't know the scriptures. And he said, oh, you're doing these things. Don't you know that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? And God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And look what you guys are doing. That's exactly where it is, that we were created by God to be quite literally temples in which the Holy Spirit of God would dwell. Let me go back a few more thousand years. Let's go all the way back to the garden. God's total concept, God's eternal purpose for the church. The garden was really a temple garden. The glory of God was there, the manifest presence of God the atmosphere of heaven. God opened up heaven, created a portal, and poured out his glory in a particular place on planet Earth, a frontier outpost of heaven on Earth. And Adam was the priest in that temple, but they needed no sacrifice because there'd never been sin. When, well, this is what God always wanted, by the way. Father and sons incorporated to be in union, a people, a family, children that would be one with him, through whom he could work, complete harmony, fullness of glory, the power of God moving. Father and sons, Inc. Father, that's Father and Sons Incorporated. And the enemy came in and stole the earth, and stole humanity. Let's skip a little bit ahead to Paul. He had one message. If you go through the New Testament, and I will mention some of these later on, great stuff in the New Testament, but in Colossians 1, Paul stated the sin, his central purpose, the thing that gripped him, the thing that moved him. And, God, and he said, God has made me a steward of this mystery. I am stewarding this mystery that God has had hidden since the fall of man. And I'm releasing that in you. And that mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory was lost when Adam and Eve sinned. The scripture says, in Romans 3.23, we've got several problems, but a major problem is all have sinned. We'll be talking about that in a minute. And fall short of the glory. That is our birthright. That is our inheritance. The very glory of God, the fire of God, burning again in these temples of the Holy Spirit. And then Paul spoke, to them on added authority because it happened in Paul before he went and taught them. He said in Galatians 1, 15, 16, when it pleased God to reveal his son in me, that was because the living Christ was living alive in Paul. Paul was operating in the level of the glory. And then Paul said, what is his prayer then for these people that God has put in his charge? He said, Galatians 4, 19, I travail again in prayer until Christ is formed in you as he's formed in me. That was Paul's passion. It's the passion of the New Testament. It's the passion of the heart of Father God since the very beginning. God in union with his people I will dwell in them, and I will walk this earth in them. When Jesus, who is our example of what a human being is capable of and should be in the eyes of God, what our Creator made us to be, when Jesus was on earth, he said, I am the expression of my Father. He said to Philip, when you see me, you see my Father. If you've seen me, you have seen my Father. Why is that? Because Jesus said, my Father and I are one. Now, 
I could never be one with this wooden pulpit. <laughs> it's impossible in the natural world. The closest to oneness in the natural world is husband and wife, where God says that they will be one flesh. Their spirits will intermingle. Well, that's a picture of what Jesus was saying. I and my Father are one. And the Bible tells us he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Spirits can join. They can intermingle. There's no limitation of space, matter, energy, and time like there is with physical matter. There's no limitation in the spirit. As I said before, the stewardship of Paul was bringing believers back in union with God. The central mystery of Christianity is union with God. Do you want to, want to know why the church seems so powerless? Because they haven't come as far back as they should come into oneness with God. Jesus said, that he was a forerunner. Paul said that, that in Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 2.10, that Jesus was made the captain or pioneer, the forerunner, the one who pointed the way, the captain of our salvation, our full salvation, so he could bring many sons back to the glory of Father God, just the way God intended it should be from the beginning bringing many sons back to the lost glory. We were created in the image of God to be expressions of God on earth, just like Jesus. Jesus himself said, the kingdom of God is within. All the treasures of God are within. All the glory is hidden within you. The problem is we just haven't yet appropriated our full inheritance. Few today know the glory, have experienced the glory, much less live in the glory and express the glory. That is getting ready to change. We are an honored generation. Don't you know the cloud of witnesses is peering over the, the, through the windows of heaven watching to see what's going to happen to this generation? I know heaven is on tiptoe watching and waiting for the moment when it's fully ignited on earth. Now, let's get back to the replaced life that we were talking about, the experience Dennis wanted me to share. You see, we were created in God's image and unlike animals who just have a biological life, we must have a spirit within us to be alive. The scripture says the body without the spirit is dead. We have to have a We're just containers. We're vessels. We're branches of, of a vine. We must have a deity spirit within us to live. Now, the problem is... Well, it's a container. We were created to be a container. Now, a coffee cup doesn't become the coffee. It just, the con it just contains the coffee. A lamp is nothing unless it has light in it. When you turn, you don't say turn on the lamp. You say turn on the light. We are just, we are created to be filled with a spirit to live. Now, at the fall, a spirit of sin, like a virus, like a contagious disease, infected Adam, and he passed on a sin spirit indwelling him to all his descendants, rather than God's spirit. So the enemy hijacked the human race. It says in 1 John 5, 19, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. But the Bible also tells us in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, speaking to believers, you, Christ made alive 
who were once dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of the world, which is infected with a sin spirit, according to the dictates of the prince of the power of the air. Who do you think is pulling the strings of most of humanity out there? The prince of the power of the air. And they are filled with his spirit to do his evil will. The prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, and were by nature children of wrath. By nature means the spirit filling us. So now you can divide entire humanity into two categories, those with a sin spirit and those who've been purchased by Christ. Now we're born with a sin spirit in Adam, so we commit sins. And let's compare what we inherited in Adam and what we inherit in Christ. Now in Adam means in the family tree of Adam. In Christ, when we've been grafted in, means in the family tree of Jesus. In Adam, we received a spirit of disobedience, a spirit of error, a spirit of sin, and a spirit of death. In Christ, we inherit a spirit of obedience, the spirit of truth, a spirit of holiness, and the spirit of life. Now, when we first get saved, we had two problems, right? We had the problem of a sin spirit inside us, a wrong nature in us. And because of that wrong nature, there were sins committed. Now, the blood of Jesus takes care of the penalty for sins committed. So there was the blood for forgiveness of sins. But to deal with that sin spirit, it took the work of the cross. God's promise, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit within you. So when Jesus died... He took all humanity with him to the cross. When he died, humanity died. When he rose, humanity rose with him. And when he, was asc he ascended to the Father, all humanity was raised to the potential of, be of sitting together with him in the heavenly places. We cannot have two spirits in us. And our self is actually determined by which spirit is emanating from us. It is impossible. So then, why do so many Christians live like they still have that old sin spirit in them? Because they haven't heard the good news and believed yet through the hearing of the ear what Christ has actually done for them. Because see, first of all, we have to understand something theologically, right? Right? might not be a lot of theology, but we have to know something is possible. A lot of people here may have gotten saved without a salvation tract. I needed a tract. I needed it explained to me. Jesus died for you, received forgiveness for your sins, welcomed him into your heart, and I got saved. It doesn't take a lot of theology, but you at least have to understand, at least most people do, to know what they're accepting so they can say yes or no, right? So, it says in the great chapter of Romans 6 and Romans 7, those two chapters, it ex Paul explains our deliverance. In chapters 1 through 5 of Romans, Paul explains the problem. That because of Adam, all sinned. All came under the same penalty of death and the wrath of God. Romans 6 and 7 explains what Jesus has rescued us from Romans 6 is you're set free. Sin no longer has dominion over you when you see what I can come and what I can come and do through you. And chapter 7 of Romans explains you don't have to try anymore. I will be the spirit within you, Jesus says. I replace that old sin spirit. I've already done it. All you have to do is see it and accept it, and I will come live my life through you, Galatians 2.20. 
it's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith, by faith in the Son of God. And that's been pretty much a lost experience since the Second Great Awakening in the Holiness Movement. What is even more astounding is that during that time, relatively few believers entered into it. And it's for our personal victory. It's not for the, it's not for the power or the flashy gifts or anything like that. It's for personal victory of Jesus living holy in us because he's the only one who can live the Christian life anyway. We can't do it. I mean, there's just nothing in us. We're, we've either got that sin spirit in us or we've got Jesus' spirit living in us. The Bible says he was made unto us sanctification or holiness. When God says, be ye holy for I, the Lord, am holy, I don't know if it occurred to you to think, I don't think I can do that. It's nice to wake up. And uh, as Clint Eastwood said, a man's got to know his limitations. <laughs> when I first got saved, I was so shocked when I read the Sermon on the Mount. I thought, God's got a real sense of humor because I sure can't do that. <laughs> However, most of us got saved and we started trying to do what's right, didn't we? And I don't know if the rest of you fell flat on your face like I did, but that's at least you know you've got somewhere to go when you're down on your face. So, we were buried with Jesus through baptism unto death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. You notice that Jesus didn't raise himself. It took the power of the Father to raise him. And it takes the power of the Father to make these different levels a reality in our lives. Remember this, that union with God and the glory is God's ultimate objective, bringing many sons unto glory. But the cross is the gateway into it. Now, the secret of union, three levels of restoration. Could we have the next slide, please? I thought y'all might want to know this, and um, you might want to take some notes. I might end up printing out a little sheet for you. Okay. Okay. The Apostle John lays out the three great levels of restoration provided to us by the cross in the book of 1 John where he says, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. That's most of the church people. Their sins are forgiven, but they don't know the deliverance that Christ has provided that they can live with an entirely new spirit filling them. And it makes it so much easier to live. Those of you who've entered into it, we've heard a lot of your testimonies with the compassion for other people that would have made you angry at one point, the ability to resist temptation easily and not give in to sin. It's a whole new way of life, and this has only been um, weeks that some of us have been walking in this. However, I know where this is headed, so I wanted you to know where this is headed to and get everybody up to speed because there's no such thing in ha as haves or have-nots when it comes to the work of the cross. This is not like seeking a, an experience or even when holy laughter and people ran around trying to have the experience of holy laughter. There are no haves or have-nots. There are no people who can't get this experience if they want it and they're willing to pay a price. Even to be, have our sins forgiven, we at least had to admit we were sinners, humble ourselves a little bit and say, Jesus, I can't live this life anymore. I need a Savior. And in the replaced life, there is a cost. You have to admit, I can't do it. I need you, Jesus, to live through me. Only you can do this. And so where we're headed is the third level. Okay, John talks about children. Your sins are forgiven. 
And then he says, I have written to you, young men, and young men is more like uh, an adolescent or teenager in sp a spiritual sense. This is who the age group that, Paul, that uh, John's referring to. I've written to you, young men, because you've overcome the wicked one. You no longer have that sin spirit in you. You know what spirit you're of. You've overcome the wicked one and the living word of God. Not ink on a page, but the living word of God abides in you. And then he goes on and says, I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning, back before the foundation of the, the world, the one with the heart that can only love, that knows nothing else but to love, that nothing knows nothing else than to give, knows nothing else than to pour out the gift of salvation, give the life of his only begotten son, that we too might live. This heart that was in God to give of himself from the very beginning, the eternal father, the author of self-giving love, to replace the selfish love that we started off this life in. Now the first level, the forgiven life, is this working? Oh, I'm doing it the wrong way. This level, Christ for me, Christ helps me, Christ answers my prayers, Christ comforts me, Christ gives me financial breakthroughs, Christ gives me healings, Christ for me is the common denominator of the child lever level. They know forgiven by Christ, primarily still live in self-love and by self-effort. And God loves his little children, but he doesn't want them to stay there. Let me give you an example I thought of this morning. Picture our little haven, almost two and a half years old. Some of you may have seen her running around here. She's a little child. Would her mother Gwen let her play with the knives in the kitchen? No, but her sister Grace, who's 18, can do what she wants as far as cooking in the kitchen. Would Jason let Haven drive a car? No. She would, she would wreck it or kill somebody and maybe herself at the same time. I mean, not that she couldn't do that with the knives if she had them. Now, how about something as simple as makeup? Would Gwen give Haven her own real makeup? Well, one time she got in Grace's makeup and we have pictures to prove what happened. <laughs> but someday she can have her own car, she can have her own knives, and she can have her own makeup. But you just can't trust little children with a lot of things that you can trust an adult with. The second level, the replaced life, which is what we're coming into because God's getting us ready for the third level. Now, the first two levels, forgiveness of sins and the replaced life, are for our personal victory so we won't bring outright reproach on the name of Jesus. I know they say they're Christians, but look how they act. Has that been true over 2,000 years? Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi said, I would have become a Christian except for the behavior of the Christians. So we need personal victory, don't we? But the third level, oh, there is a cost. You have to admit you can't do it, as we mentioned before. At each level requires some humility. But then the third level, the level of fathers, the empowered life, the life brought back to the glory of God. If you haven't read it, I suggest you, and if you're not frightened, um, get a copy of Reese Howell's Intercessor and read chapter 5. It lays out the cost, but it lays out the reward. Now, the second level is Christ in me, Christ living as me. Raised with Christ, the mark, so many people are testifying that they notice a new level of compassionate love for other people. 
particularly those other people on the road, like Dennis, and um, other people have mentioned compassion in situations where they would have become irritated. Compassionate love and victorious living, no longer continually blowing it. I noticed it in my own life. If, if I did something like spilled water on the computer keyboard or... Um, in this case, we have in our downstairs, we have kind of unfortunately, they've been a little bit of a problem, but we have end tables and a coffee table with ledges of wood and then glass laid on top of it so you can see through, which is nice, except if you spill something on the table, you have to take everything off of it, take the glass out and dry up all the liquid or you'll get water, the white water marks wherever that liquid from runs under the glass. So kind of an annoying thing to happen. So we went down there to pray the other day and I had um, some water with me and in my hand went to turn on the lamp and I poured out the water on the table. And I stood there with my mouth open as it went all over the table and started going under the glass and dripping on the floor. And usually I would have gotten mad at myself or gotten mad at the circumstances. Oh, no, why did this happen? You know, all that. Can you imagine Jesus acting like we act sometimes? <laughs> oh, man, I told you to get the room ready for Passover and look at this, and you didn't get the right bread. So anyway. <laughs> but all I said was, oh no, and ran to get a roll of paper towels, calmly took everything off the table, cleaned up the mess by the time Dennis got down there to pray. But I thought, that's Jesus. Amen. That, I was quite impressed. <laughs> Jesus is pretty cool, you know. <laughs> so now, the empowered life, back to the glory but this level is marked by sacrificial love. Jesus acted it out. I read a story by Corey Ten Boom about Tori Ten Boom once to see how far God showed her how short she fell of sacrificial love. She had said, God, I will go anywhere in the world for you. And he told her, I want you to go visit Gertrude in that building. And she said, but God, that's 10 flights of stairs. <laughs> and she realized her selfishness and her lack of willingness to sacrifice for somebody else. She did go at the end, though. Marked by sacrificial love so that when God tells us to go where he needs us to go, we'll be obedient this is the level of ascended with Christ. This is throne life, y'all. This is life seated together with him in the heavenly places. And, and by the way, those who are the overcomers in the book of Revelation, those are in the third level. They're the ones who recognize that the window that's open in heaven, that John said in in, um, in Revelation 4, 1, 1, he saw a window open in heaven. That window has never been shut. That window has never been shut. It's available for every believer. It's available for every believer to come up hither and overcome, Jesus said, as I overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. And the, in Revelation 3.21, Jesus said, for you who overcome, I'm extending an invitation to you to come up hither and be seated together with me at the side of, at the side of my Father. This is the invitation. This is the place of the glory, the authority, and the power. This is the place of the full adult, those that God knows he can trust with the goods. Now, you can give some gifts to people at the first level and even some gifts to people at the second level, but you can only trust the big guns to those 
who have laid down their lives, who've surrendered it all because God has no fear that they'll give in to the temptations that Jesus overcame in the wilderness. You could use the gifts and make a name for yourself, people. And I'm sure a lot of people have. You can use the gifts and make money for yourself. You can carve yourself out your own little kingdom on earth using the gifts. But not if you have the selfishness crucified out of you. It'll all be for God. It'll be with people, for people that God has learned he can trust. This is the level of Romans 12, kings and priests. By the way, Romans 6 and 7 lays out the replaced life. Romans 8 through 16 is the empowered life. And in Romans 12, he says, in light of all that I've shared with you on what God's taught me about this empowered level, this level of being ascended, this level of being enthroned with Christ, because Paul starts out giving his story, he says, therefore, in light of what you have read from Romans 8 through 12, in light of this, I plead with you, brothers, offer your lives a living sacrifice so that you may live as I am living at this time. He's pleading with them to come to that level. By the way, the book of Romans is total concept beginning to end. Ephesians is the book of level three. Colossians is the book of level two, risen with Christ. Hebrews is Paul's message, if you believe, as I do, that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Yeah. Hey, now, the Ephesians are living it. But here he comes, the people he writes the book of Hebrews to, and he says, what is, have you become dull of hearing? Have you not seen our high priest Melchizedek and the offer that he extends to you? And you're becoming like little children where you should be teaching from the level of the Father, when you should be teaching from the enthroned life, and you're reluctant to enter into this? He's telling them, get a grip on. Today, if you hear his voice, make this decision for God. What will you say to him when you stand before him? Oh, well, I just didn't want to. I felt kind of lazy and... We'll give an account. And the book of Hebrews is really interesting to read in light that it's a rebuke for believers who knew the truth and wouldn't move to the third level. Let's go to the next slide. You know, God did a lot of things in threes in the Old and New Testament. The Trinity, a picture of perfect oneness in the Godhead, a picture of the oneness that God wants now between God and all his children. The Trinity operated in perfect oneness. Solomon's temple, there was the, the outer court, the, inner, the holy place and the holy of holies. Uh, Jesus talks about the blade, the ear, and the full corn in the ear. He talks about 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. Uh, three is the number for divine perfection, completion, and fullness. And we're talking about level three here. Now, if you look at the tabernacle, this was the outer court. You notice it was open to the stars at night and the light of the sun in, at, by day. You go through a curtain and enter the holy place, and there were some articles of furniture in the holy place. Oh, out here was the burnt altar, of burnt offering, and the lava. So that's Jesus, our offering has been sacrificed for us. This is the level of being forgiven. You've, been, you've accepted the sacrifice of Jesus. You've been washed and cleansed by the blood through the lava where the priest washed. And now there's only a curtain. There isn't even a door to enter into the holy place. Let's go to the next slide. And in the holy place, there were three pieces of furniture. There was a, the table of showbread on one side. On the other side, there was the golden lampstand. Then before 
you would enter into the curtain that divided the holy place from the holy of holies, there was an altar of incense for prayer and worship. Now, in the holy place, the light was the light of revelation, the oil, the flames from the golden lampstand. It's a new level of living, new level of understanding. However, when you enter the Holy of Holies, and now consider this, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, the Ark of the Covenant with the presence of God was in the Holy of Holies, but once the Aaronic priesthood was established, only one person, the high priest, ever entered into the manifest presence of God, and that was only once a year. Now, what happened when Jesus was crucified? A great earthquake came, and the veil of the temple was torn in half. The power and the glory of God flooded the streets so much so that it raised many of the saints who were dead, came out of the graves, and they were seen walking around Jerusalem. The power of God was allowed out. And then here comes Jesus. The devil kills him. He was one man walking around. He was a portable glory. The glory had been confined in a stationary building or a stationary tabernacle for the most part. But now, all of a sudden, here was Jesus, and wherever he went, he took the glory. When Jesus died for us, the glory was deposited within us if we let it out. The glory can now, through us, can cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, but only through a company of surrendered lives, the overcomers. Now, there is no veil separating it. He says in Hebrews, we can now come boldly to the throne of grace. And by the way, this is the fullness of grace. Grace does not cover your sins. Grace does not give an okay to sin because you're just forgiven. We know you can't live any better. Grace is being filled with the fullness of God. Jesus said in John 14, verse 23, I and my Father will come and make our home in you. The awakening that is upon us, whereas the revelation of the Son, the revelation of the Spirit of holiness, and now the revelation of the indwelling of Father God, so that the glory will be visible upon God's people once again. Those who come to this level walk in the authority, the power, and glory of God. Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, 13, that our Father's kingdom is a kingdom of power and glory. On the third level, we operate under the order of Melchizedek, our great high priest, as priest bridging the gap between heaven and earth for the sake of others. And as kings, we will reign as kings in life through the authority, power, and glory of the kingdom being revealed through our lives. For how shall people believe that the Father is with us if we don't demonstrate his power and his glory to others on earth. That's the purpose of the greater works. And Jesus said, it's my Father within me who does the works. And because I go to the Father and I've prepared a place to take all of you so that there won't be distance any longer between you and our Father, greater works than these shall you do. These are the greater works for those who fully surrender their life. This is the third level for what the Bible calls the huios of God, the sons of God, the fully grown, mature, completed, perfected sons of God. And it, Paul says in Romans 8, 14, the sons of God don't just walk by the Spirit, don't just live by the Spirit, but they're led by the Spirit. 
Catherine Kuhlman said, as she walked in third level power, she said, it costs everything. It cost me everything. But then she said, but I really didn't have so much anyway. <laughs> we really don't have so much anyway. Let's face it. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness so he could face the three temptations and win victory for us. That's the Greek word ago, ago, and it means to lead by taking hold of to bring to a specific destination. It means to impel, to drive forcefully. Paul said, the love of Christ compels us so we don't have any other option than to do what we do. During his earth walk, Jesus was led by his Father at every point. I only do what I see my Father do. I only say what I hear my Father say. I and my Father are one. The Father who dwells in me does the works. Assuredly, I say to you, who, who, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also and greater works than these because I go to the Father and I'm taking away, I'm making a way for you to go back to the Father. Jesus came to prepare the way, he says, so that where he is, we may be also. And to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. Jesus laid his life down to be a vessel of God's love for others. We're offered the same opportunity. Jesus even tells us to count the cost. And Jesus also tells us, he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. And Romans 12.1 in the New Living Translation says, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will accept. When you think of what he's done for you, is this really too much to ask? God is love, unconditional, no selfishness, lives to give. And by the way, just as a little little addition, an additional note here, we say Jesus Hamashiach, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now Jesus was his name. Christ, or Mashiach, is his office. He was anointed on earth as the Messiah to do a specific task. And at the end, when he was giving up his life on the cross, he said, it is finished. He had accomplished his task. Christ, our head, is, um, is seated at the right hand of Father God, right? However, we are his body, the body of Christ, the body with that same anointing and that same commission on earth to complete a task for our generation. We're here for a purpose. And guess what? We accepted this assignment when we got saved. Jesus already paid for all this for us. We already enlisted in the army, guys. Some of us may be AWOL, but we enlisted. God is calling us to become part of a company to take up our cross and fully follow, follow Jesus. But the word tells us that many are called, but few are chosen, that is commissioned. God's reward in all this is he finally will have a huge number of sons of God that he can know as intimately as Adam and Eve could have known him in the garden. Our reward is God's heart in us, his glory and his power and his authority, Christ in us, the hope of glory restored to us. And we take up the same assignment Jesus had, which is ultimately to be teachers of these, these truths. 
and also bring many sons unto glory, not win converts, but disciple them in the fullness of God's heart. And I believe we're going to need centers in the days ahead when this gets underway, where there will need to be many mothers and fathers in the spirit acting as teachers to disciple a whole new generation of what God's intention for mankind truly is. We are going to pray for people to enter into the second level for those who haven't Could I yet. have that first chart up again? I'm going to give the lay terminology after you got the theology. Okay. Level num number one, the forgiven life. We've spent decades going church to church to teach believers how to forgive from the heart. So you see, we're not really that advanced. And our information was considered profound by many, teaching how to forgive. And what is most of the people even concerned with when you talk to b believers? Me, myself, and I, my ministry, my, 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 my blessings, problems. <laughs> my problems, my blessing. Me has to change to we. We has to change to he. I really believe that what we've endeavored to do over the past uh, few years anyway is to really emphasize the we. That sin is a spirit and it's outside of you. The true you is a new creation. And this this no matter what your theology is, you're living like there's a good dog and a bad dog on the inside of you. How many agree? Because you talk bad about yourself, don't you, on occasion? So you're basically saying, you're denying, there's no white dog, black dog, good dog, bad dog, and they used to have the expression, well, how does it win? The one you feed the most. No, no, you don't have an evil nature and a good nature. You've got God's nature. All temptation is on the outside of you trying to draw you away from the real you, the new creation you. How many did I lose right now just with that? No one? That's good. Because you can have the right theology and never enter into the second level. You can spend your entire Christian life. And by the way, all of our how-tos are teaching people, little children, how to not only receive forgiveness properly, but how to live a forgiveness lifestyle. And even then, we had to constantly reinforce the fact that lordship, not just Jesus your Savior, but lordship is letting the peace of God rule, Jesus rules, and pointing them toward the we. If we've been pointing you toward the we, but there, you still get worn out, you still get tired, there's self-effort. Self-effort is an independent self. That's what needs to take place to become in that second category. A replaced life. To, you say a selfless prayer. I'm repenting of trying to live the Christian life in my own strength. Even if I've got good theology, my experience is still good me, bad me. That has to die once and for all. And until you say, I can't, how do I make that die once? That's, that's a good question. All you have to do is want it. See that it's available is the first step. Then hold your heart open until it comes. I really admire Jennifer. For all the 20 years we were married, I knew this was her passion. She had the theology without the experience. Yeah, bookcases full of books about it. Bookcases full of books. <laughs> Books about what could be. And then lately, within the last year, when God said, if you didn't experience it, would you still believe? That's, this is what, this, these are the hungry people that are going to be filled. These are the ones that are going to move to another level. Not the ones that are looking for someone to just lay hands on me and do it to me without any effort on my part. There's no instant maturity. <laughs> maturity comes by the work of the cross. So there is a progressive work at level one, but there's also the part that we're excited about now is God has already begun teaching us 
how to's for a level two. And some of those pamphlets back there, how to, re how to resist temptation at level two. It's different because temptation at level two is basically seeing that all temptation is outside of you, tailored for you to pull the best out of you. There's a battle, but there's a blessing. And the blessing is that wherever you're tempted, consider it pure joy because it's going to produce something good. Look at the resurrection side instead of the pain side. That's the child only looks at, ooh, that, doesn't, that sounds like that would hurt. <laughs> I'm going to avoid pain at all costs. This is the one where it says, for the joy set before me, I'll endure whatever is necessary because it's going to produce something good. But there's a cross in there. But the resurrection side is so worth it. You'll consider it light affliction. How many want to pray right now to repent from trying to live the Christian life in your own strength? Die. How many can see the theology behind this? Can you die to good dog, bad dog on the inside of you? Good you, bad you. That's going to hinder you forever because that's the enemy's perfect plan is if he can get you away from the new creation and the real you, he can, he can just beat you up all the time. There you go again. You know, where in reality, at the second level, you're seeing the world is pulling on your appetites. But the interesting thing is, is when he pulls on them, you're going to see that there's a moderation and there's a power, empowerment, because I am what I am by the grace of God. And it's one together with him. So, the, and... How many are willing to hold your heart open if you don't get something instantly like Jennifer? That's the attitude that gets blessed. I'm not going to shut down if something doesn't happen to me instantly. Seeing that it's there is the first step in receiving. How many can see that it's there theologically? It's available. Uh, if you can see it, then you can get it. It's just a question of staying open to it and hungering and thirsting after it. Jason had three weeks before me, and he kept saying, did you get it yet? Did you get it yet? And every I'm going, day, every day, several times a every day. Every day. And I'm going, <laughs> I saw the reality of what transpired in him. And all I knew is I wanted it. I understood it theologically, and I wasn't going to shut down. I don't have any control over the timetable. That's his, that's his business. Fortunately, we're finding a lot of people get it automatically, but a lot of people, it can be transferred through impartation. And if you get upset that you didn't <laughs> get it, that's the flesh where the enemies pulled you out from among your new creation. The five deadly seas. Note takers, write this down. If you see this manifest, you need to bring it to the cross. Covet, compare, compete, conceal, and complain. If you're doing that in light of more of Jesus, that's in the way. Would you agree? I don't get what Jason got. What would that be? Comparing and competing. And complaining. And complaining. Everything but conceal. Yeah. <laughs> if you say it out loud, if you keep it inside, then you even did that. That's called a hardened heart, right? <laughs> can you see the theology? Raise your hand if you can see that it's available. All right. It's Romans 6, 7, and 8, but... This replaced life is being available. And I got it sovereignly. Jason got it sovereignly. You, and you I laid hands, hands on Jennifer because I'm going, oh my goodness, this isn't, <laughs> I was going to say, this isn't fair. She's the one that's been on this for ever since we got married. I want to move to another level. But see, this was good because I think the impartation is a major secret for our time because in the second great awakening, people would just wait. And I read in a magazine article of some particular situation where somebody passed on the experience through impartation after asking everybody to close their eyes and let God check their heart for unrepented of sin first. And so then Dennis demonstrated that with me. And then probably the majority of people who've received this in this fellowship, it was through impartation when you came up for prayer. 
So that's it's exciting. The first that means level, this is going to spread and spread fast. In the first level, your primary emphasis is asking for forgiveness from sin. The second level is receiving forgiveness for self. And self will show its ugly head in so many different ways. It can make an idol. I believe this is even where Jesus said, unless you hate mother, father, wife, you cannot be my disciple. Those are pretty strong words, aren't they? But what he's saying is, you can make an idol out of anything. And I will not share my glory with another. Even good things. You can do it with your ministry. You can do it with your wife. You can do it with your kids. So Father, right now, I want self that already, this has already been provided in my salvation, but that self that was crucified when Jesus was crucified, that self was buried, and that self, mind, will, and emotions, was raised into newness of life in the spirit of Jesus Christ. I was fused together as uh, oneness with the Lord. One, They that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him, and that is the real me. That is the real me, and I renounce uh, any, any old bad theology of thinking there's a good me and a bad me inside. I renounce that right now. I let it die. That was carried to the grave. That evil, that evil spirit went when Jesus took and died on the cross. I am what I am by the grace of God and through regeneration by the washing of the water of the word and the renewing power of the Holy Spirit. I am what I am by the grace of God and I like me. I love God and love his word. The new creation loves God and loves his word. Any any thought or action that is tempting me is coming from the outside of me trying to draw me back into the ways of uh, disobedience. And so Father right now I release I release that old self, once and for all, buried and the power, resurrection power of the Father raised me into newness of life to the second level, to where I have the living word abiding in me, in Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want to also going to pray, you, you, this can happen sovereignly for those that are hungering and uh, seeking after it, but also, if you want prayer for it, we believe for impartation, but you stay open whether something happens instantly or not. Open, open, open. The heart remains open, but the first step is you have to believe that it's even available. Do you believe it's available? Yes. All right. You want the experience of it is the secondary experience. Why don't you, uh, anybody on this side that wants prayer, come on this whole uh, this section first. If you've already received, you don't need to if come If you already up. <laughs> received, don't come back up. All right. Jason, do you want to Jason, come Jason, will you come up and pray with us? Hey, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I just want to release. I release it. I release it. <clears throat> Definitely receive, Val. Your spirit's wide open. I just release it, release it, release it. And I'm going to hold my heart open. I'm going to, and look for the fruit of a changed life. You will see a moderation. You'll see tolerance. You'll see compassion where there was no compassion. You'll see different responses. That's what you're looking for. Look for fruit. Look for fruit. We just release this right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus' name. Amen. You Amen. You may be seated. Uh, this section right here, middle right. Thank you, Lord. Father, right now we just release an impartation. Time for transition, time right to here. graduate. You know, it's funny, as I taught this for decades without the experience. There is a difference now, and I just release an impartation for that exchange, replaced life. For lack of a better term, we're calling it the replaced life. It's Jesus in you, who's already been in there with your salvation, coming up, and you're allowing him to live his life through you. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me. 
this life that I live in the flesh. You see, flesh is not automatically sin. This life that I live in the flesh, in the, your mind, will, and emotions is neutral. It's a question of if it's the spirit of sin or the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Increase, 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 increase. Just release that exchange. This day I'm exchanged. This is like getting born again again without messing with your theology. We just labor that Christ be formed in you afresh and anew. Afresh and anew. Yeah. So far the fruit that we've seen in people's lives is moderation. The appetites that are trying to pull them away. All of a sudden there's a new internal strength, which is obviously Jesus. Remember, in order to sin in an exchange life where Jesus is Lord of your life, in order to sin, your appetites have to pull you back out into the worldly atmosphere of this, where the sons of disobedience and where the prince of the power air operates. Not a badness in you. Got it? If you don't get that part, you don't even know what you're asking for. It's not badness in you. You're a new creation. The real you loves God and loves his word. Any bad is outside of you, but it can draw upon your senses and appetites. And if you give in, then you sin. Now this section, and by the way, I, I had the experience the third time I got prayer for it, so. And if your heart is right, and somebody gets a dramatic experience and you don't, if your heart was right, you will be so overjoyed and rejoicing. I just cried for Jason when he got it. It wasn't until a couple weeks <laughs> that I had to deal with my flesh. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We rejoice with them that rejoice. We weep with them that weep. Thank you, Jesus. We just This is a day where I exchange my life. Now, keep in mind, I've been in ministry 42 years, and according to my current revelation, not the way I've taught it in the past, according to my current revelation, I just moved from child to young man myself, experientially. Wow. Wow. 42 years. I'm glad I didn't wait any longer. A living God. And I prophesied this a month and a half ago, that the living word was going to become our value system, not ink on a page. The living word was going to visit his church and become the living word on the inside. I speak to you, young men, because the word abides. The living word, the personal of Jesus, abides in you. And you've overcome the wicked one. You're clear now that you're not the bad person. That evil's out there and it wants you. It wants to draw you into its arena. But you don't have to go there. Because greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. It's about time these scriptures start working. <laughs> We're good at quoting them. I want to start seeing them work. I want to see the greater one in me working to will and to perform according to his good pleasure. I'm telling you, you know how I know this is real? Jennifer told me not to get into this too much. <laughs> I'm looking at suffering scriptures, and they're almost exciting. <laughs> Consider it pure joy when you fall into marriage, because th there's a battle, yes, nobody likes that. And I don't like pain. What I like is that that battle is now an opportunity for him to overcome, and even if death works in your flesh, if death works in me, it's going to be an anointing for somebody else. That's a proper attitude. That's the way to live Christianity instead of me, myself, and I, my ministry, my gift, my, my. Me has to change to we. Section over here. And we has to change to he. That would be the three levels. From me to we. From we to just he. Thank you, Lord. We just, we just release that exchange. God bless you. God bless 
All things are possible with God. Only believe. You have to believe that it's available first so that you know what you're asking for. And then saying, the, today is the day where I bury the bad me that I think is my problem. Right now I bury the bad me because he was buried with Jesus. It was already done for me. It is now I that it's become a we. And it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. This life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. We just re release it in Jesus' name. First, first you have to believe it's available. Secondly, just release that impartation in Jesus' name. are we doing anybody excited how many have had a clear experience so that other people can see from previous weeks raise your hand where you've known that you know that you know and there's some people that I know that are traveling and doing some other things and that they just couldn't wait to say I'm gonna be gone but I got it I got it <laughs> Okay, but again, we're not emphasizing an experience as much as we're experiencing graduating to a new level in your relationship through the cross of Jesus, not short of the cross. And we're praying for the third level. We're praying for the third level. Mm -hmm. You have a testimony? Well, come on up. <laughs> Bring Josiah. Get, let's get Josiah on camera. <laughs> yeah. My question was, um, what is there like a progression of this thing? Is it does it grow? Mm -hmm. You grow because, stronger because grow. because in my experience, it's been like just a, the little flip and yeah, then, yes. and then kind of like a raising yeah. Up. Yeah, it says, consider pure joy when you fall into various trials that the testing of your faith produces. There is a progression, just like in level one. You get stronger. You get stronger by reason of use. This is what, in the message to the Hebrews, that was the part that he was upset with. By reason of use, you, you should be you teachers. Take serious, you take it serious. You take it serious. refuse it. So it may start as small as seeing yourself not upset with something that normally right. upsets you. Right. Good. That's we, a good we question. We all know that over the years you grew, even in the first level, right? You became more mature. You learned you could trust God. You learned more and more about him. You saw him come through for you. He increased your faith for you. So, so there's growth on every level. There's, there's a instant on the three levels, but there's a progression in all three levels. Jesus learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Then Jesus said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Then there was the enemy taking him into being tempted. The enemy wanted to tempt him, but the Holy Spirit sent him into that area for a perfect temptation to overcome the battle for the victory on the other side. And you too are being tempted perfectly. Perfectly. Tailored for you. Now, so the, you'll go, so you're weak now God doesn't tempt anybody but he's certainly aware of what you need and you will be able to, how did we teach this at level one? Your negative emotions are your friends. They tell you Jesus isn't ruling. When you're in hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame, what do we tell you? Same thing, same principle. Those are your friends. You don't want negative emotions, but what are they telling you? Jesus isn't ruling right now. Utilize that as a battleground for a victory. Want to end with that song, I Surrender? 
that would be a Go ahead. Let's do that. Can we do that last I song? I surrender some. I surrender. Let's stand to our feet and surrender some more. <laughs> and some more after that. Okay. Do you realize every step of graduation is based on surrender, not trying? That's the very thing we're trying to break. And that will be the very point of frustration for some believers. They'll start trying. Well, uh, maybe I didn't do it right. Maybe I ought to. Maybe I ought to. That, that's the very thing that has to die. Comparing, coveting, competing. That's an indication. It's got to go back to death. Death. And now... At this second level, you know what you'll start to see? Self. Self will start raising its head. And it'll be stuff that's not sin in and of itself, but that you're not willing to let go of. Let's pray for that now. I wanna, we want to move to the third level, but I want to show you how to deal with the second level. If you start seeing change, yeah, you won't be sinning as regular. That's the good news. The bad news is self will start to expose itself. And stuff that you didn't normally think was bad, you're going to see, you're, you're, what you're really saying is, I will not have that man Jesus rule over me. I want to hang on to this or that. And this or that's not bad. It is if it's replacing him. So, Father, right now, we pray for a spirit of wisdom and revelation. He's been giving us revelation of the scriptures like I haven't seen in, in decades. And, but I'll tell you what, he's revealing self. He's revealing a lot of things that you wouldn't call sin as sin because it's self. It's self doesn't want to let go of certain things and say, I will not have that man Jesus ruling in that area. I must be in control. You can do that with your families. You can do that with education. You can, you can take something good and make an idol out of it. That's why Jesus used such strong language. Unless you hate mother, father, wife, husband, you cannot be my disciple. Because he knows, he knows you might deal with blatant sin, but he also knows that self loves to be on the throne at that second level. And I'm telling you what, you enter in that second level and all of a sudden, it's like turning the light on in a dark room. You're going to see self. It's going to expose what it won't let go of. So, Father, right now, I repent of all the things that I'm seeing. I am welcoming you to turn the light on to self on the inside because that old self died. And I see there's a progression even on this second level. To uh, There's a new awareness That self wants preeminence. And why is Jesus saying, I want you to deal with wherever self becomes king? You know why? He wants it dethroned in your life so that you can move to the third level and be a true king and priest. He can't trust you to be a king and a priest. He can't trust you to be others oriented when you're still stuck on you. So, Father, right now, bring to death even those that have entered into a mild level of second Self is going to start being exposed, and we're asking right now by the power of the Spirit that as you expose that self, we're going to humble ourselves and cleanse ourselves of its right to rule. We're going to have the attitude that was in Christ Jesus to make ourselves of no reputation. No reputation. In Jesus' name, amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the Spirit 
by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-Day Challenge, Self-Deliverance, Healing Rejection, Codependency, Intimate Prayer, The Functions of the Human Spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you could take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.